Coming up on DTNS, T-Mobile makes it all unlimited. Is Facebook on the decline? And how the internet makes it hard to forget your past. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we literally spent a lot of time talking about what kinds of things you can and cannot eat out of a mug on Good Day Internet. Came up with some recipes, had some breakthroughs. If you'd like that wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google will hold its developer conference, Google I.O., as a virtual event on May 18th through the 20th. It will be free to anybody to access. Google canceled the event last year. Dell announced AMD Ryzen 5000 editions of its G15 and Alienware M15 gaming laptops, in addition to existing laptops with 10th generation Intel chips. The AMD equipped M15 launches April 15th, starting at $1,794, and the G15 comes along May 4th, starting at $900. The first third-party products that work with Apple's Find My system have launched, including VanMoof's S3 and X3 e-bikes, Belkin's Soundform Freedom True Wireless earbuds, and the Chipolo OneSpot tracking tag. Just like AirPods and iPhones, you can use these devices to find my profile, to use that, and use the Bluetooth network of Apple devices out there to locate them if they go missing. Uber and Lyft have a driver shortage. Both companies saw drivers drop off the platform during 2020 because of lack of people looking for rides. Uh, drivers are still down around 40% on each platform. Uh, now people are starting to hop in cars again, and the services don't have enough drivers to meet the demand. Uber announced it will spend $250 million on incentives to encourage drivers to join back up. And Lyft is covering the cost of rental cars, offering $800 sign-up bonuses, and promising extra cash if a trip takes longer than nine minutes. Spotify now has an in-app voice assistant on Android and iOS. When the app is open, you can say, hey, Spotify, and then ask the app to play a song or playlist or an artist. You have the app open. You have to have the app open and give it access to your device's microphone for it to work properly. I have a feeling in a couple of years, this will no longer be a story. It'll just be like, oh, this app doesn't have voice. Why does this have, app have exactly. voice? Exactly, yeah. yeah. You can't say, hey, app, do my yeah. thing. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little more about what T-Mobile's doing, Scott. Sure, T-Mobile, you all know them and love them, I guess, announced the launch of its wireless home internet service. This is different than using your phone at home for internet service or you know, tying it to your laptop or something. Instead, you get a Wi-Fi gateway that connects to T-Mobile's LTE and 5G networks and then acts as a cable or fiber internet service would in your home. So uh, in, in effect, it's just like getting wired internet, uh, except it isn't wired. Speeds vary, though T-Mobile says all customers will get at least 50 megabits and the average speed will be around 100 megabits. That's pretty good. Uh, whatever, the sur or, excuse me, whatever the speed you get in your location, you get unlimited data, no throttling, all of that for $60 a month. Of the 30 million people in the U.S., mainland, and Hawaii who can get the service, 10 million are in rural areas. Sorry, Alaska, no good up there. Uh, rollout will be slowed by limited availability of Wi-Fi gateways, which is related to the global chip shortage. Uh, T-Mobile announced Wednesday it will upgrade all existing postpaid customers to unlimited plans at no additional cost. That includes former Sprint customers. Uh, the U.S. carrier also launched a plan for customers on the or on other carrier carriers to get unlimited plans and trade in their phones. So a lot going on there with uh, T-Mobile. But I got to say, I think that price is pretty strong for that level of uh, of, of uh, broadband and not having any caps or throttling is a huge deal right now. Yeah, just real quickly, uh, making all your plans unlimited, super smart for T-Mobile. Great way to try to you know grab some market share. Uh, with Sprint's network, they now have very good coverage. Uh, so you might get a lot more people in. Uh, and I'm excited as a T-Mobile subscriber. So uh, good, good move, good competitive move by T-Mobile. The home internet thing, is really interesting because this is one of the first big operators, certainly not the first to offer wireless internet service at home. Uh, Verizon's doing it, a bunch of others are doing it. Some people like Starry have been doing it for years, but this is the first big rollout of, of marketing to say you can use 5G just like you would a, 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 a cable connection. 
not going to be as good as fiber, but but this will be a stable connection. Now, granted, not all of these are 5G, so they won't have that capacity reliability of 5G, but you're going to see a lot of companies using wireless as home internet because of the advantages of, of capacity uh, that 5G offers. Yeah, the the whole, I mean, in the business that we're all in, where uh, it it it's really important to have something that's that's very very true when you're doing a home connection and and doing shows. To me, I'm like, ooh, 100 megabits per second sounds great, but without being wired, scary. Right, that like said, we talked we, we talk about that pre-show. Yeah, yeah. We talked pre-show a about it. Is, I know- and I didn't mean to interrupt, but the, when we talked about pre-show, the first thing that came to my mind, Sarah, was this feeling of, oh no, what's my ping going to be like in my favorite first-person shooter? It's a, you know, it's an edge case for gamers, but it's always the first thing I go to. And when you say wireless, I think latency and inconsistent latency. If it's consistent, yeah. Even if it's not great, I'm still better with the consistency than I am with something that's just flopping all over the place. And that's the advantage of 5G. And that's why it's 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 a little fudgy here because they're like, some of it will be on LTE, but they're rolling more 5G out everywhere. 5G provides really good lag, you know, really, really decent jitter and latency uh, and, and great capability. So it's never going to be the same as fiber, though. So if that really matters to you, then this isn't going to be for you. But I, I think what you were saying, Sarah, is for $60 a month, especially if you're in a rural area that didn't have anything but DSL before now, that's a good option. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely a, and and I, I know some people are out there saying, yes, I'm super excited about this, and please let us know. Uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com if you have thoughts about this, but but yes, this is this is something that would frighten me personally. <laughs> but I also I am I you know I have the privilege of being able to you know plug in my Mac Mini. So so uh, yeah, again I pay more than sixty dollars a month for internet. So that's you know it, there's a trade off there. Yeah, I'm paying an extra. I forget what I pay extra per month to Comcast to give me no caps, but it's kind of ridiculous and way overpriced and dumb. I would be tempted by this if it came through here, and it probably will. I think we're I think we're in an area where we could get good T-Mobile uh, access. Yeah, wi- wireless is not what it used to be. It's it's a lot more reliable, especially on 5G. And this means we're going to see more competition because, while it's not, it's still you got to roll out infrastructure to roll out wireless. If you're somebody like T-Mobile that already has it, it's going to be easier to provide a home internet connection this way than to put cable in the ground. So, good stuff. On Tuesday, in a blog post, Facebook acknowledged the free posting of account information of more than 503 million individuals and provided a few more details. We've talked about this on the show before. The the big new thing is that it's freely available, but here's what we know. To recap, this information was already available for a fee, but has now been made available for free. That's the news. Facebook says this data set is a combination of data some of which was scraped from Facebook prior to September 2019, that's what they said in their blog post, using a flaw in the contact importer tool that Facebook says it fixed in 2019. Basically, you could just ping it with a bunch of numbers and get stuff out of it. That tool was meant to let you use your contact list to find friends on Facebook, but a malicious actor could just keep trying phone numbers at random until they hit a match and then access more info about that person. The data set includes phone numbers, email addresses, hometowns, full names, and birth dates. It does not include your financial information, health information, or passwords. So this is not a data breach in that sense. This is more probably stuff people could find out about you anyway, but it makes it easy in a nice big data set that's all collated together. As we mentioned before, this is useful for phishing or spamming you. So best to be aware it could be out there in case somebody comes with your birth date, full name, address, and tries to pretend they're somebody they're not, you can say, wait a minute, you could have got that from a Facebook data set. But there's really not a lot of action you can take directly about it. Now, Facebook may face questions about the proper reporting of this breach in Europe. Europe's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, came into force May 2018. In April 2018, prior to GDPR, Facebook reported a phone lookup breach had occurred between June 2017 and April 2018. But in the blog post Tuesday, Facebook referred to a contact importer tool. Facebook says it fixed the contact importer vulnerability in August 2019. 
Facebook says this current data set, as I mentioned, is a combined with additional records, which may be from a later period. But they don't say those later records are necessarily from them. They're, they're being a little fudgy about it. The question is whether any of the additional data in this data set was taken from Facebook post-April 2018 and therefore should have been reported under the GDPR. If that's the case, Facebook may face some fines. Facebook is treating this like public collection of data, not a data breach. They're trying to say, this is stuff we couldn't stop people from getting. They just got really good at getting it, hence the lack of reporting or notifying users. You only notify users or report it if it's a breach. Somebody got into your database. If somebody just goes out on the internet and starts scraping stuff off websites, the websites aren't responsible for that. So Facebook's treating it like that. I don't know if you guys think Facebook has a, a case there or not. Well, you're obviously going to see an uptick in um, phishing. Well, the more people can scrape from a site, the more they can fish you, or the more these these uh, traditional ways of getting people's private data without actually having that private data, those rates go up, the more you can scrape. So you could make the argument that there's too much to scrape. And I don't know what that looks like in terms of governmental oversight, but just from a Facebook user standpoint, maybe they have to trim back what's out there. I don't know, or give us more control over what we uh, allow to be scraped. Maybe they already do that. I can list whether I'm married or not, or I can list whether I graduated from whatever college or whatever and or not. So maybe, again, it's on us to, to pull back some of that data. But if it really is just the equivalent of a public site scraping, then uh, I kind of think they're maybe right in this case. Um, I, mean, I don't know. It's like also, I don't know. I mean, Facebook is also... As as other platforms also do, wants to be your number one platform for everything. When I first read the story, and I was like, does doesn't include financial information, which is what other people can glean. I was like, well, that's good, but like financial information on Facebook, well, yeah, because Facebook has introduced ways to pay for things. That's uh, again, not Facebook is not alone. That is not the only way that you can do this stuff, but huh. Financial information, if that were to be something that could be scraped, would be an issue. That's not the case right now, but it's something I think, at least for me, I kind of have to remind myself of, you have to really trust a platform to give that platform your information because it's going to be more convenient for your life and know that if somebody is smart enough, they might be able to access it. Yeah. I mean, I don't use Facebook. I don't really like Facebook, but I want to be I want to be fair in the criticism. And if this is stuff that could have been gotten otherwise, or maybe even was gotten otherwise, these data sets often are a combination of a bunch of things. Then you know I don't think it's fair to hold Facebook's feet to the fire for something they didn't do. Uh, I know a lot of people want to do it anyway because they just don't like Facebook that much. So uh, I, I'll be very interested to see because it does feel like they're being a little shady about it. I can't tell if that's just because they don't know where the information came from or if they're really trying to hide the fact that they should have reported this and they're going to get a 2% fine, uh, which is a big fine. All right, folks, we are doing a crossover show this month with This Week in Science, Saturday, April 17th at 4 p.m. Pacific. Join me, Sarah Ooh. Roger, Dr. Kiki Blair and Justin from Twiss. And let us know what topics you'd like us to tag team on on the show. We want your ideas. Email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're going to put all our minds together and talk about the intersection of tech and science. The show happens again April 17th at 4 p.m. Pacific. Pew Research Center published a new report on how people in the U.S. use social media. Speaking of Facebook, YouTube is the most widely used social platform, increasing from 73% 70, of adults surveyed in 2019 to 81% this year. So on the up and up. Facebook is at number two at 69%, an unchanged number since 2019. In fact, most platforms saw stagnation. Besides YouTube, only Reddit saw statistically significant growth, growing from 11% in 2019 to 18% in 2021. Instagram held number three at 40%, Pinterest at 31, and LinkedIn at 28. But if you use it, you use it a lot. 49% of Facebook users check multiple times a day. Same for 45% of Snapchat users and 38% of Instagram users. TikTok showed up in the report for the first time, with 21% of people in the U.S. saying that they use it. But that percentage rises to 48 if you're between the ages of 18 to 29. 
Wow. I, uh, we had a lot of discussion prior to this, uh, to the show about, uh, these stats. And of course, you know, we, we had to make it kind of clear between the, the three of us that this is, you know, poll data. This isn't like, you know, blockchain verified, uh, uh, you know, data from some servers telling us exactly who's using what. So, you know, take that for whatever you will. But, uh, Tom threw out the idea that maybe this shows things aren't so great at Facebook. Uh, showing it being kind of flat for two years is a sign of not just reaching a crescendo or market saturation. It's maybe a sign of not necessarily backlash, but a pulling back. Uh, so I don't know. I'd, lo I'd love to hear Tom talk more about that because that conceptually is kind of a, that's a hard pill for, for, for Facebook to have to, to look at, I would think. Yeah, 69% uh, is not enough for me to say, oh, it's saturation. If they're like 84%, 85%, somewhere up there, I might say like, oh, well, they're flat because they've just really hit the limit of number of people who are going to use Facebook. But I feel like this is the first evidence of a backlash. And whether, like you say, it's people just saying they don't use Facebook, even though they do, because this is self-reported, uh, or whether it's it's actually representative of usage, I think it's a backlash either way, right? But it, it is the first evidence because we've been saying forever people are gonna stop people say they're gonna stop using Facebook, but the usage data stays high. The monthly active users stay high. Uh, and this is the first time I've seen, man, over two years, they didn't gain anything in the US. Now, there are other parts of the world where they're they're certainly gaining. Uh, I don't think Facebook is in trouble because of that, but I think this is significant that they have they have lost people in the United States. Yeah. And it was a tumultuous, you know, couple of years for them. They were under the spotlight a lot. They had to testify a lot. There were a lot of reasons to be mad at Facebook or to tell your friends to quit or, or whatever it was. Uh, you know, not not the best two years for those guys. The one thing that really stood out to me that surprised me was that YouTube is way up on top, and it shouldn't surprise me. I was saying before the show, uh, of course, this is a a site that has something for everybody. It doesn't matter what your age is, what your financial status is, uh, what you're into, what you're not into. There's something for everybody there um, from the very mundane to the controversial. And it's just all in one site. So, of course, it's it's number one. But that took me by surprise. I thought it'd be like Facebook. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Twitter would be up higher than oh, it is. But, like Twitter's but not nearly people with there. kids, Scott. People yeah. with kids. Yeah. You got to have YouTube. <laughs> it's the yeah. Only, it's the only you way do. they'll leave you alone for an hour while you're making dinner. The you're only thing that really um, – yeah, the YouTube – the YouTube thing to me is I am, I'm not a huge YouTube, uh, viewer, but, uh, but I know not just people with kids, but, but particularly families have, you know, they can find a lot of things from YouTube that, you know, can sort of satisfy everyone's needs. The only thing that really struck me as somewhat odd were the Reddit numbers, 11% 2019, 18% in 2021. So it's, it's still, um, I mean, we're not talking like crazy growth, but I would have thought at this point Reddit would be a little bit more saturated. Like if you're on Reddit already, you're you're there. You want to be there. You got like your subreddits, like, you do your thing. Yeah. It's such a it's, weird site though, because it's I agree with you. Like the people that it's really designed for, we're at that saturation point. But I feel like Reddit is now suddenly more public to everybody else and it's starting yeah. to be glommed onto by demographics or, or readers or users who normally wouldn't go to yeah, reddit so true. i don't know it's a reddit's it's weird. still reddit's weird. mostly young men who make more than fifty thousand dollars looking at this stuff with co right. the co that are college educated which is historically what it's been and if if that's what all it was ever going to appeal to it wouldn't be growing i think sarah's right it is starting to appeal outside of that demo uh and and just anecdotally you know my wife uses reddit for things like she's like oh i went on the reddit for BTS or uh, Korean food or, you know, like it's becoming more and more of a resource and that follows on them uh, cracking down a little more on some of the, the more wild West behavior on Reddit over the past couple of years. So that's interesting. Next door has almost next to nothing. Twitter's just for journalists and podcasters who want to hear each other talk like <laughs> the rest of this, I guess Pinterest is a little higher than I would have put it, but that's because I'm not in the, in the demo. Uh, but it, it's pretty widely spread Evenly, you'd think it would be mostly female. No, you're wrong. It's actually pretty equally spread between men and women, uh, white and black users, not as much with Hispanic. 
pretty much, you know, over 65s are short, but the rest are even. So th these are interesting numbers. It helps you break your biases to look at this. Lauren Good has an article on Wired called, I called off my wedding. The internet will never forget. Uh, in May 2019, uh, Lauren Good ended an eight-year relationship, she talks about this in the story, and canceled her wedding. She took a picture of her breakfast that day, a fried egg. Why does she still remember that? Because that picture recently popped up as a memory in a photo app. Maybe a memory she wasn't super excited to see. She also sees wedding ads on Instagram still, collages of wedding uh, pr uh, photos suggested for her on Pinterest, Monthly happy anniversary emails kept coming from Wedding Wire for years on the day she had originally planned to get married. The algorithm doesn't know she canceled the wedding, and memory features are everywhere these days. Facebook launched on this day in 2015. Apple added memories to its Photos app in 2016. The widgets that just came out in iOS last year let you have it just pop up cool stuff from your photos. In 2019, Google Photos added memories to its app. Snapchat and Instagram have added memory features. Memories keep you in apps, which in many cases means the apps can then show you ads. So while happy memories may be the sales pitch, anything that keeps you there is a win for the app. Lauren Good isn't the only one to experience this, but most people don't. So the majority rules as far as the algorithm goes, which means it's a lot of work if you want to untrain it. And all that work is on you. They're not tools to help you go remove photos or unlike things or change your Pinterest preferences. And companies aren't likely to put in the effort to help because it's not the majority of the users and it doesn't make them any money. Should we all be more careful with what we save, photograph, and pin just in case? Yes. I mean, I, oh, I don't want to I don't want to say that a company couldn't do well to give you some tools to help control that better always do that but at the end of the day if i got real weird on a friday night and posted something dumb and then five years later i was reminded of it i'm just being reminded of how dumb i was <laughs> like I, it's still on me right i feel like it is i'm sure this is controversial but i think we. i should love be that that's your example it. scott yeah. you're like oh i just got like weird on a friday and now i don't want to know about it five five years later okay so all kidding aside so Lauren Good, friend of the show, um, and it, this is a really great article. If you, if you if you have some time to read it, it's it's good in its entirety. But she she makes a really good point of listen. Okay, I live a life online. I had all sorts of stuff that was connected to a certain person online, and that that life ended for me. And now I'm constantly reminded of this person in various ways. And you sort of go like, well, okay, if you could, I don't know. I mean, sure, like cancel your, you know, get rid of your Facebook account or, or block the person on Facebook. There are certain, there are certain platforms that you can, you can make this work. I have this exact same issue, well, similar anyway, with, uh, with <clears throat> iOS photos where once in a while, and I, and I had, I had opted in, you know, where it's like, do you want to be reminded of stuff? And I, I opted in. So I said, yes, every so often I'll be like on this day in 2011, you were doing this. And I'd be like, Oh, that guy. Ugh. Yeah. And it like, it really sucks. It kind of, it kind of ruins your day. And it is not an algorithm that's trying to ruin my day, but what am I going to do? Go through 9,000 photos and try to figure out which ones are, aren't appropriate for this sort of thing. It requires so much work on the human's part to, to make this work effectively. And most people just aren't going to do that. But at the same time, it can, it can be a real bummer. Yeah. And, and sure, the easy thing is like, well, then don't use that service. Don't use the reminder thing. Don't use the memories thing. Um, and, and sure, uh, that's kind of throwing out the bathwater and the baby at the same time, though. Like, I love getting old pictures of my dogs, even the dogs that are no longer with us, uh, showing up in my photos widget. It's fun. It's cool. Like, oh, remember this time when we were at the beach? Every so often, the picture that we took of Django, my old dog, on her last day with us, shows up. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't really need to see that one come back in the rotation, right? Yeah. But how do you do that? I'm like, it, for me, it's like, you know what? I'll put up with that 
every so happening every so often in order to get all the other fun stuff. It's a personal equation for everybody, right? But I, it's 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 unfortunate that you know you have to go through so much work to be able to use some of this stuff. Some of it you can't avoid. Some of these things that you know are, are just built into the app. It's like, well, you're just not going to use the Google Photos app because it's going to show memories at the top of the app for you. I mean. Uh, and then there's things like that wedding reminder that Lauren was getting where she just couldn't get it to stop. She couldn't yeah. even delete her account. They would, they, they'll let you deactivate it, but not delete it. Yeah. And on the flip side of this real quick, I, there are, there have been multiple times where something will show up in that memories thing and I'll go, ah, I totally forgot. I did that. I am reposting that now. I don't even know where that file is. I'm glad I found it here and I'll back it up even. Yeah. So it's not I mean, like those well, times don't happen. Yeah. It's like, I, I feel like, well, I mean, I don't even want to say like the majority of the time, but some of the time, those photos, you're like, that was so cool. Thank you. I really mm -hmm. like that. I really yeah. like this feature. It's just the ones where you go, oh, man. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> if I could it's only just kind get of it a bummer of that it takes that much work to get rid of those those bummer moments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, this one might not be a bummer <laughs> depending on who you are <laughs> the soviet union's version of lord of the rings first aired on leningrad television back in 1991 a while ago the station's successor 5 tv recently uploaded the entire work to youtube in two parts this particular adaptation focuses only on the first of tolkien's trilogy the fellowship of the ring and has its own as some people would say, Soviet flair. Da, это хорошо. Uh, or not. Maybe it's not that good. I don't know. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, I've We covered this on Cord Killers. I'm going to be talking about it on Sword and Laser. Like, this is lighting the internet on fire uh, this week, it, it feels like. Because it's just so odd and very <laughs> Soviet. It was aired, like, mere months before the Soviet Union ended. It was December 1991 when they lowered the, the hammer and the sickle uh, in Moscow, the hammer and sickle flag. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, the, it's a piece of its time. And uh, Roger was saying he was reading something where they were just so far out of money at this point on Leningrad TV that they're like, yeah, let's let's do what we can with what we got. And it shows. Yeah, I, it looks insanely uh, dumb and I totally want to see it. Uh, I would really like some uh, some translated subtitle stuff. Uh, Tom, if you're available, we'll we'll work, we'll work that out. Um, but yeah, this kind of stuff I love it when this sort of stuff comes out. That's kind of when I found the um, the movie that was Spider Man and Superman in the same movie from an Indian film, and it was absolutely not approved by DC or Marvel, but it's wonderful. Just a musical, and they dance and they fly together, and it's ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, uh, more of this. It's what the internet's for. It's what it was always for. I mean, listen, I Lord of the Rings, the trilogy was like one of my favorite trilogies of all time. So just knowing that there's some version of at least the first the first book, I will watch this. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the hobbits are dressed like 1800s era Russians and speaking Russian, <laughs> but it's still Lord of the Rings. Folks. Right. It's still Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But that aside, yeah. still really fun and nostalgic for everybody. Yeah. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's do it. This one comes from Derek, who says he's from sunny, cloudy, rainy, windy, warm, <laughs> and cold Minnesota. Yep, uh, all and yeah, all true. Well, you know, keep keep fighting the good fight, Derek. Uh, Derek says regarding the Android Auto discussion from Tuesday's show, Sarah stated very definitively that Google Maps is far and away better than Apple Maps. Derek says I have to disagree. I travel weekly for work, and I'm often driving in strange cities. I have far more issues with Google Maps turn-by-turn -turn navigation, sometimes taking me through a series of side streets and exit ramps. Google Maps also waits just slightly longer to announce upcoming exits and turns. Apple Maps tends to suggest the more logical route and can anticipate turns, what lane to be in, and proper navigation. Google Maps does have more search and location data available, stores, Yelp, that sort of thing. But for turn-by-turn, -turn, not even a contest. Apple Maps wins every time. Um, I mean, I hate to agree with this because I was super annoyed with Apple Maps in the beginning. I thought it was stupid and lame and a weird, like, uh, turnabout <laughs> where Apple's like, we're not working with you anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And I was just annoyed by it. And the first version was terrible. And anyway, and that was a long time ago, but I just really wrote it off. And then lately, though, I don't know, the last five, six, seven times I've had to use navigation point-by-point -point stuff, Apple Maps tends to 
lead me in the wrong direction, or uh, uh, Google Maps rather, and Apple Maps don't. Uh, they just are better at stuff around the Salt Lake City metropolitan area. Now that may be different city to city. I don't really know, but a lot of times Kim will turn on Google Maps, I'll turn on Apple Maps, and I'll win. And I'll get us there quicker, better routes, better traffic, notifications, all that stuff. So I feel like they got it. They got there and they got it, but it took a while and it was not the first or second or third version. It was it was a ways down the road. Uh, I will admit Apple Maps is much improved. If you're still thinking it's what it was when it launched, uh, you need to try it. It's way better. Uh, I don't like that it doesn't work on any of my Android devices for some reason, no matter how hard I try. Uh, so, you know, that's a big downside for it. Uh, also, I, I like Google Waze. Uh, I say Google Waze because to remind you that Google owns Waze, but Waze is my go-to. Now, if I'm not worried about traffic at all, which is occasionally still true, uh, then I might do Google Maps just out of habit. I, I don't, but uh, Way, Waze is my preference because that'll that'll cut through LA traffic like like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, you've always been a Waze guy though. Like before yeah. they picked them up, I remember mm -hmm. people would say, "Tom, what do you do?" Waze, Waze, Waze. I, I struggle to like Waze. It's very, I don't know, cartoonish or something. But you know what, Derek? Thank you for bringing this <laughs> yeah, up. Stuff, Derek. It's a, it's important to remind ourselves that. Not every app, as 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 Apple Maps was to me a few years ago, is the same app today. And and uh, companies make improvements all the time. If you have feedback for anything that we have talked about on a previous show, anything we might talk about on a future show, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Also, I'd like to shout out patrons at our master and grand master levels. Today, they include Dan Kolbeck, Chris Benito, and John and Becky Johnston. Also, extra special thanks to Jeffrey Zilks, a.k.a. Dark Redeemer, our top 10 lifetime supporter list. You are in that, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Scott, what's been going on with you? Well, actually kind of a big deal this week. I um, launched a Kickstarter I've been working on for almost two years now, and um, it finally happened. So if you like card games and you like having a little competitive fun with your friends or your family, and uh, you like science fiction, and you like my artwork, if you like any of those things in any combination, uh, go check it out. The Kickstarter's up now. We kind of blew through our goal, which surprised us, and now we have some really cool uh, secondary stretch goals that have just opened up. It's called Rock Runners Incorporated. You can find the entire thing and all the information at frogpants.com slash rockrunners, and I hope a bunch of you like it. Excellent. Well, we are live on this show, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Bookmark it and join us. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>